But I want to welcome all of you. This is the 70th anniversary of the America's first offensive op operation after Pearl Harbor was attacked. So I'd like to recognize the Guadalcanal veterans ashore and afloat. You Guadalcanal veterans. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome our speaker today, Jim Hornfisher. Well, General Maya, thank you for that introduction. Um, I'm proud to be here today, to be with you, to be with uh, active duty military men and women who've served, gone into harm's way. I'm especially proud to be here with uh, veterans of the Guadalcanal campaign, Chief Johnny Johnson, um, veteran of the USS San Francisco, uh, was of such incredible help in getting this book written. Um, you enabled me through your association, through the Naval Order, the San Francisco Naval Order, to meet veterans of the campaign, uh, through whom I was able to get a, a real personal understanding of what took place in the South Pacific in, uh, in those desperate months in 1942. So thank you for being here, and thank you for your, your assistance of the past several years. Um, I'm really proud to be here uh, at a place like the, uh, the Marines Memorial Hotel and, and Club, because uh, a place like this really um, has to be the keeper of the history. You can hardly get off the elevator, in fact, without running smack into it. And bump your head on a big frame picture of a Medal of Honor recipient, read, read about a Navy Cross or Silver Star recipient from Vietnam or from Fallujah or someplace in between. Um, and it seems to me that there's a real responsibility that this, an institution like this has in its membership to know the history and to be able to shoot down the myths. You mentioned uh, Iwo Jima, and you'll hear someone say in the street, Oh, I heard they posed that photo. And you'll know that Joe Rosenthal had a roll of film that he sent back, and there were a lot of pictures in that roll, and one or two of them were posed, but the famous one wasn't. And you might hear, you know, oh, the Guadalcanal, that's where, that's where the Marines got dropped off, and the Navy hightailed it, and the Marines were left to win the thing on their own. And we'll, we'll deal with that one here today. <laughs> and hopefully by the time you leave, you'll know the answer uh, to that rather uh, specious suggestion. So um, anyway, I'm thrilled to be here. I, I can never come to San Francisco really without uh, feeling very close to this history and remembering the events that, that took place right down here at Pier 16 in the harbor on December 11th, 1942. That was the day the old USS San Francisco CA-32 uh, returned to the West Coast after Guadalcanal was, all, was largely wrapped up. And uh, the ship was still bearing the, the scarred, uh, scars on her paint and, and holes from shrapnel damage and pulled into the harbor uh, to get her due. I'm hoping this is going to work. I talked about the artwork that you're likely to bump your head into when you get off the elevator. This one's right out here by the elevator here. I took this picture this morning. Um, and it shows uh, the day of Peter Pearson's the artist. And uh, this, this, this photo, the caption says, December 4th, 1942. And if you read it too quickly, you'll think, oh, this is, this is at Pearl Harbor. You'll think, oh, oh, this is right before the Pearl Harbor attack until you realize, oh, 42. <laughs> the story of that year is what we're going to talk about today and how the epic events that preceded this moment when the ship returns to the city, um, that's what we're going to talk about. It's an epic story, and it's unfamiliar to the average American. On this day of all days, the 70th anniversary of the landings, we should resolve to do something about that and know who, for example, Admiral Callahan was and what he did. And that's my goal with this presentation. Now, um, most of you will know out at Land's End, there's a, uh, a touching memorial that's uh, based around an old piece of steel that was on the bridge wing of the San Francisco the night she got all shot up, the night Admiral Callahan sailed to glory. Um, that memorial is an incredible uh, place to visit. There's a, there's a vista there of, of the, the, the ocean and the, the trees and the, and the sky that just really uh, won't be matched in my experience. And with the exception of the old USS Salem, which is parked in a really obscure corner of uh, industrial Boston, there's nowhere else you can go to really uh, pay tribute to what the cruiser fleet did for this country. They took it on the chin everywhere they fought. We lost the majority, for the first couple of years of the war, we, we the majority of our active duty cruisers in the Pacific were sunk. I think the first seven to go into action went to the bottom. Um, and so this is a wonderful place to visit. 
And that little piece of uh, 3 8 inch steel is an echo of this day, uh, November 13th, 1942, Friday the 13th, and the ordeal of the crew um, and their shipmates, including, you know, it, it was the night when Admiral Callahan was killed, Captain Cason Young, Admiral um, Callahan's, virtually his entire staff, as well as a hundred of their shipmates, paid the price. The terror of that night, reforming in the dark, the battered task force, reassembling, less, most of its senior officers trying to figure out who was in command. The long journey of the battered task force back to the forward base at Espirito Santo. The ghastly process of the body part sweep that took place when the sun rose and the San Francisco had to clean itself up to return to base. And then the sudden submarine attack uh, that morning, later that morning, when the uh, spread of torpedoes uh, fingered through the damaged task force and everybody watched in horror as the USS Juno was blown to kingdom come with 10 survivors. These are the events that I remember when I go to a place like Land's End and stand at this memorial. And so the events of those 48 hours in, in, in mid-November were the climax and culmination of the six-month campaign of attrition that kicked off on this day 70 years ago. And uh, I think it's just, I'm just filled with pride to be here to talk about it. The Guadalcanal landings were the first major offensive operation that Allied forces took anywhere worldwide against the Axis. It was before North Africa, it was before everything, and it could have gone either way. Our Navy didn't know where it was going. You can say that because the maps and charts were relics of the 19th century. It didn't know what it was going to do when it got there. The rehearsals were a disaster in the Coral Islands. There were terrible disagreements over the plan for aircraft carrier support once the troops were ashore. The fleet didn't, literally didn't even know what day it was. One of Admiral, Admiral Kincaid's carrier task force forgot to account for the international date line as it traveled south. And so was, was, uh, as a consequence, USS, uh, one of the carriers, was, was low on fuel on D-Day. They weren't ready for battle. The Imperial Japanese Navy was the finest naval fighting force in the world at that time, and it spent six months proving it. But by the end of these hundred days, off Guadalcanal, which saw a major amphibious operation blossom ashore, seven major actions at sea, five of them um, terrible surface battles fought around midnight in the pitch dark, hull to hull. The Marines and the Navy had learned to fight. They would discovered their warrior spirit, and they'd broken the Japanese will in spirit and body to fight, really, in this kind of sustained way that was necessary to win a theater-wide war. We have no time to do the whole campaign here today. Uh, hopefully you'll thank me for that. But the example and the legend of, of one naval officer in particular who found himself at the point of the spear is really who I want to bring into focus today. He's a long time, he was a longtime resident of San Francisco, grew up in Oakland, went to St. Ignatius, and his name is uh, Daniel J. Callahan. It's General Vandegrift and his staff, the landings, and Admiral Callahan. He served as naval aide to President Franklin Roosevelt. He served as a captain of the San Francisco up until early 1942. And in April, I believe it was, he was plucked from that post and sent for a, a tour of staff work reporting to uh, Vice Admiral Robert L. Gormley, Com SOPAC, as planning for Operation Watchtower and kicked off. Admiral Callahan died in action less than a month later. From after, I'm sorry, he died uh, less than a month after returning to his post at sea. He's largely a cipher to people who uh, write books and therefore also to the public. We know fairly little about him, but they tend to be the same things from book to book. But it, it's really been thanks to my association with Chief Johnny and his, and his shipmates and, and, and his colleagues at the Naval Order that I've been able to uh, gain some insight into what Admiral Callahan was all about and specifically uh, how he conducted the battle of Friday the 13th. As Admiral Gormley's aide, he was eyewitness to the planning um, and to the controversies that attended what was known as Operation Shoestring, this hastily planned invasion that was kicked off in August because of the, the threat of Japan operating uh, an air base from Guadalcanal, which would have threatened our sea lanes to Australia. It was kicked off in haste and um, thrown together. The 1st Marine Division was sent to New Zealand. The fleets were rendezvoused from all points in the compass, converging in the South Pacific in August. And the man who was in, in command of this, uh, this operation, Admiral Gormley, 
quickly found himself in over his head. He was considered one of our premier naval strategists. He was considered uh, a, a very fine gentleman, uh, a, a tremendous diplomat. And prior to taking command in the South Pacific, he was in London serving as President Roosevelt's eyes and ears as the Blitz proceeded. He was reporting on the doings of the Luftwaffe and even more nefariously the doings of the United States Army who had its own ambitions to take over um, air power. And so he'd report on what the Army was up to as well as what, the, what Hermann Goring and, his, and, 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 uh, and, the, and, the, and the Luftwaffe were doing. Um, I've never served in uniform, so I'm sympathetic with people who are faced with insurmountable or, or never before confronted challenges and problems, and I'm hesitant to judge them. But it was the judgment of Admiral Nimitz and Admiral Nimitz's staff as the Guadalcanal, Guadalcanal campaign rolled along that Admiral Gormley was not only um, a micromanager, he was not only remote from the fighting front, uh, obsessed with detail, somewhat of a pessimist. What dawned on Admiral Nimitz and his staff is that as, as the Japanese were, uh, you know, having their way with us in the first weeks of the campaign, they concluded Admiral Gormley was having a nervous breakdown in command. Uh, this was revealed to me by Admiral Gormley's own son. He showed me a letter he wrote Admiral Nimitz in uh, 1961, asking Admiral Nimitz, why did you relieve my father? And Nimitz responded very forthrightly and, and told him, my staff and I concluded your, fa your father was having a nervous breakdown. And the upshot of all of this is that Admiral Callahan, newly appointed to his uh, two-star post, was sent back to the fleet. He had been uh, Gormley's chief of staff, he, he implored Admiral Halsey for sea duty, and sea duty gave him command of the cruiser task force. He returned to the old days uh, on the USS San Francisco, his old ship, uh, where he was very warmly received, as Chief Johnny Johnson will tell you, and you might ask him after I'm done. Um, he was highly popular, well-liked by the crew, took an interest in all of his officers, dined with all of them um, on larger ships. Senior officers stayed apart from the younger, younger guys but not so with Callahan. In fact, he, he welcomed every new recruit to the ship, asked them about their family, and earned the nickname Uncle Dan because of his, his folksy way. He was just very approachable, very friendly. And so when he, when he, when he leaves Admiral Gormley's service and staff, staff service and returns to the fleet, he chooses the San Francisco for his flagship. Historians since have, have often uh, criticized him for this decision. They said he should have gone to a ship with more modern uh, radar equipment. Certainly there were ships such as that in the cruiser force at Guadalcanal. But he, he preferred the comforts of a ship properly equipped to serve as a flagship, his old command, and so he chose the San Francisco. Um, a sailor named Eugene Tarrant, who couldn't be with us today, he lives in Berkeley, some of you may know him, held the post of Captain's Cook and found from that humble position on the ship he had a position from which he could observe Admiral Callahan at work and at rest. There were no men on a ship really who were wiser to the ways of, of the wardroom than the, uh, than the uh, servants of S Division. They were there serving the coffee and the food and, and listened in on the scuttlebutt. They were a lowly cast, but they were, they were given this privilege of hearing uh, what was really going on. So Admiral Callahan um, was discussing uh, the news on November 12th, I believe it was, 11th or 12th, news of an aircraft sighting that had come down through uh, Kelly Turner's headquarters, Kelly Turner being the uh, officer in command of the, the amphibious situation and of the immediate Guadalcanal area, including the naval forces. And Callahan hears that there was an air sighting of uh, ja heavy Japanese ships plunging south. At, now, um, Eugene Tarrant told me, I heard all about the plans. They talk about what forces they were going up against, what they ex when they expected contact with the enemy, and how they planned to deploy the fleet. The Japanese responded, of course, very swiftly. In August, they inflicted the, the Battle of Savo Island on our fleet, destroying four cruisers. They, uh, in turn, um, uh, received it on the chin in October, the Battle of Cape Esperance, where uh, Norman Scott came to the fore as a tactician. Uh, inflicting the first victory by U.S. surface forces over the Japanese. The change of command kind of sidelines Scott. Callahan takes his place in time to face the big November push. Japan is able to muster a, an offensive push against Guadalcanal roughly every month. It was a huge logistical undertaking to marshal uh, troops, get them on board transports, worry about their supplies and their stores and their ammunition. Um, uh, 
form up task forces to send down to protect them, carriers kind of standing off, providing air cover, cruisers and destroyers in close, battleships to go bombard the island, massive major planning challenges. And Japan was able to muster basically one a month after the Marines took the island. November was the big one. It was a massive um, offensive involving multiple naval task forces. And um, it would fall ultimately to Admiral Callahan and his hastily assembled squadron of cruisers and destroyers to intercept uh, this new threat. And so in the midnight morning, um, in the mid after midnight morning of the 12th, Admiral uh, Kelly Turner informs Callahan that patrol planes had reported two battleships or heavy cruisers, six destroyers, and other unknown ships southbound at 25 knots. Tarrant was on duty when Callahan received the order to gather his cruisers and destroyers from, from three task forces and take them into action. Now, at the news that a fight with battleships was brewing, Admiral Callahan knew immediately what this meant. Battleships were roughly three times the size of the San Francisco. The San Francisco and the Portland were the two largest ships he had. They were heavy cruisers, about 10,000 tons apiece. Um, now, when the moment presented itself, one of the younger officers, uh, Jack Bennett, ventured to ask Admiral Callahan if he thought that, this, that the odds were really uh, as dire as they sounded, and if this, if this really was a fool's errand to engage such a powerful Japanese force. And as, as Tarrant recalled overhearing this, Callahan was candid. He said, yes, it may be that suicide, but we're going in. Bennett remembers Callahan in an agitated state, sometimes waving his arms as he, re as he remarked, this is suicide, but we have to do it. As Bennett saw, Callahan was calm, unemotional, resolute, and perhaps resigned to his fate in the end. Now, rumors had a way of sweeping a ship like wildfire, and word spread through the San Francisco that Callahan uh, deemed his, these orders a death sentence. We were all prepared to die. There was just no doubt about it, said Joseph Witt, a seaman first class on the San Francisco, whose battle station was in turret one. We could not survive against those battleships. Now, the melee that takes place when the forces collide after midnight on uh, November 13th is a story that was hard to tell, because once that orderly column of 13 ships coming up from the south under Callahan make contact with the three loose formations of Japanese ships. You see the larger battleships in the center, if that's even uh, visible for those with eyesight issues. You see the Hien and the Kirishima, those two large white blips, 37,000 ton battleships. Um, very hard to, to tell the story of this battle once the shooting takes, really starts, because you know, it devolves quickly into a ship-to-ship -ship affair, with each ship worrying about its own survival, its own targets, its own problems, as damage is taken, as fires start, as flooding starts to pull the ships under. Um, and so the title of my book, Neptune's Inferno, really derives from this experience, trying to make sense of, of what happened on this night when so many men died and so many ships were lost. One ship in the task force, as I alluded to earlier, had a virtually perfect view. This was the USS Helena. This was the light cruiser steaming behind the San Francisco, behind the Portland, actually behind the San Francisco. Um, the PPI scope of the search radar is a familiar two-dimensional circular display. The radar wasn't always set up that way. It was kind of a revolutionary breakthrough to have a set that would give you that kind of tabletop perspective of a battle unfolding. The Helena had this radar, but Admiral Callahan, unfortunately, didn't really have access to it being situated in San Francisco. But the Helena radar showed three groups of vessels. One group at 312 degrees true ranged 27,100 yards out. A second group at 310 degrees ranged 28,000 yards, and a third at 310 degrees at 32,000 yards. With this data, you can, you can understand how a commander could run a battle when he has this picture. But Callahan did it the old-fashioned way. This was, the, this, is, this was how he came of age. This is how he was trained. It was really the state of the art of fleet tactics was to do it the old-fashioned way. The, the bulletins for how to use the radar, the tactical manuals, hadn't even been written yet. So we can't fault him for failing to use radar. This is, this is hindsight. People who criticize him for this are exercising historical hindsight. And I came to realize this about midway through my research, that this was profoundly unfair to criticize somebody for not using a technology that really hadn't been uh, operationally um, adopted yet. The radio logs that document the approach show Admiral Callahan torn between his competing senses, 
querying his destroyers ahead about what they were actually seeing while the Helen had dutifully tried to weigh in over the single channel radio, which was blocked by Callahan's transmissions, um, delivering contacts from the radar, which Callahan seemed to ignore. Nearly every question he asked the Cushing at the head of his van, the Helena could have answered um, following half a mile behind. Callahan placed his faith in people and not technics, a preference that was expressed by his selection of the ship that led his column. The Cushing, the destroyer Cushing, was captained by a man named uh, Butch Parker, Edwin N. Butch Parker, who was a veteran of the Java campaign, one of the best ship handlers in the fleet, uh, tin can sailor par excellence, who Callahan, Callahan appreciated his, his talents. And so this, he, was, um, he was really the only uh, destroyer veteran who had any kind of experience in surface battles coming out of the Java campaign, and Callahan had him at the head of the line for a reason. Okay, but in, in possession of this electronic picture, the Helena's captain, Gilbert Hoover, and his gunnery officer chafed at Callahan's evident lack of interest in their electronic scouting. The fact that only one person at a time could send messages to send messages over the TBS radio made it impractical for Hoover or anyone else to raise questions. And the way Callahan arranged his column minimized the value of their most advanced sensors. You see the Helena kind of at the back. The, the, um, the Fletcher also had modern radar, and you'll see the Fletcher if you're able to read that small type. Number 13 in line. Okay, so a properly trained radar savvy force would not have been organized this way, but the fight was never planned to to be unfold as a properly uh, executed, radar-enabled battle. As someone later said, it was like an Irish bar fight with a light shot out. And that's exactly what, transpo that's exactly what transpires after, at about 1.40 in the morning when lookouts in the Cushing sight a strange ship slide past several thousand yards ahead in the dark. Captain Parker radioed Admiral Callahan um, that this, that he, uh, a visual contact. There's a ship crossing on our bow from port to starboard, range 4,000 yards maximum. Another ship appeared, followed by a larger one. When the range had closed to 2,000 yards, Captain Parker turned to Cushing to port to bring his torpedo batteries to bear. The destroyer division commander asked Cal Admiral Callahan permission to make a torpedo attack. Shall I let them have a couple of fish, he radioed. Callahan denied the request. He wants to hit him with gunfire. He doesn't want the destroyers blowing his initiative. And Callahan has a, has a purpose here. We have to go and we have to do this. Uh, he knows he's facing much larger ships. He knows he's got to get in close, not with his, well, not with his destroyers in, in the front of the line. His cruisers have to get in close. And he wants, to, he wants to do so without betraying his position to the Japanese. So Captain Parker soon has to veer to port to avoid a collision with the Japanese ships in front of him. So too did the Laffey, following second in line, and the Sterrett, and then the O'Bannon. All of them turning sharply to avoid um, a telescopic, or to avoid collisions and thereby causing this kind of telescopic buckling of the entire line. Around 1.45 a.m., about 50, uh, the, the silence ended when the blast of guns from the leading units of the opposing task forces. The fire control officers in the Atlanta were, first, were the first of the cruisers to glimpse the chaos at the intersection of the enemy force, of the two opposing forces. Now, um, through his binoculars, um, McCandless, the officer of the deck, Bruce McCandless, lieutenant commander, officer of the deck in the San Francisco, made out the silhouette of a light cruiser crossing ahead of the Atlanta at 6,000 yards. Close ahead, four van destroyers were broadside to his own ship's course, making emergency turns to avoid collisions. Captain Jenkins of the Atlanta uh, swung the helm sharply to avoid the collision, and when Callahan saw the ship heeling over, veering away to the rest, he said, what are you doing, Sam? Avoiding our own destroyers, was the reply. Callahan then said, come back to your course as soon as you can. You're throwing the whole column into disorder. Now, maneuvering room for everybody was growing pretty scarce when Admiral Callahan gave uh, uh, his last meaningful command to his column. It was an order to change course 90 degrees to the left, directly into the midst of the Japanese widely dispersed force. It was a mystery to participants in the battle uh, at the time and to analysts in decades to come why Callahan never issued a written battle plan to his commanders ahead of time. My best guess is that he realized that against battleships, as I said, he had to get in close where heavy armor was no protection. 
Now, soon after the shooting started, Callahan ordered uh, odd ships commence fire to starboard, even to port. By then, it was far too late. The captains and, and gunnery officers of each ship had chosen their own targets, and chaos was quickly enveloping and overwhelming any officer's ability to take control of the situation. The largest of the Japanese ships, the battleship Hie, as well as her sister ship, Kirishima. We have the lead destroyer, Cushing. I tried to put them more or less to scale. I'm not sure that I succeeded, but the Hie outweighs that ship by, by about 20 to 1. A destroyer's life expectancy and action against a ship of such size was short. Each ship would get in its licks, would move past, and then it was the next ship's turn. On and on. The ships would circle back, they'd lose the ability to maneuver, targets would appear and disappear, smoke would kind of swirl through the picture and quickly confusing the ability to even tell friend from foe. And at this tra a, a terrible tragedy ensues now. After the, after the um, destroyers have their turn of it, three of those lead destroyers were quickly sunk. And the Atlanta, I've already established her turning sharply to port, short argument with the task force commander, what are you doing? Um, the Atlanta veers, both ships, the, the, the San Francisco tries to follow the Atlanta, but the bigger ship can't turn with her, wider turns, sharper turns by the Atlanta quickly, um, and the flashing of gunfire and the smoke, and quickly the San Francisco loses track of the Atlanta. The Atlanta takes a torpedo, and then is quickly taken under fire by a heavy cruiser about 3,500 yards abaft her port beam, okay, behind her to the left. The Atlanta gunners attempt to return fire on this new interloper with the only turret that was responsive on the intercom, but stood down when the light of the discharge of their assailant's guns revealed the familiar silhouette of an American heavy cruiser. This is the San Francisco firing into the Atlanta. Now, hits to the pilot house of the Atlanta by the San Francisco killed 16 of the 20 men stationed there, including Admiral Scott, the combat veteran who was Callahan's number two in the fight, the great hero of Cape Esperance. In the confusion, the San Francisco had simply lost track of her. Commander McCandless would later write, probably she drifted into our line of fire, an almost perfectly flat trajectory at that range. Perhaps something like that was inevitable in the wild, free-swinging brawl that resulted when the two formations merged. Around that time, the all-seeing PPI rate scope on the Helena her surface search radar showed a total of 26 blips within the 5,000 yard sweep of the microwave radar beam. The radar abstracts all of it and makes it comprehensible. You can imagine what it must have been like to be in the middle of it on one of those blips. Now, Callahan's and his Japanese counterpart, Admiral Abe, their heaviest ships came to grips just before 2 a.m. San Francisco was closing with three formidable opponents a cruiser, a back to starboard beam, the Hiei approaching forward for starboard beam, but at about 200, about 2,200 yards, and then another battleship, the Kirishima, about 300, about 3,000 yards out. According to Bruce McCandless, quote, the duel about to begin, which flagship fought flagship, was like something out of the past. The action was brief but violent, as the Hiei and San Francisco approached on, on opposite courses. When Captain Young with Captain Young choosing targets for his gunnery officer, McCandless swung the helm left to unmask the San Francisco's after eight inch turrets. Both ships fired on each other more or less at the same moment, San Francisco and the Hie. Two four gun salvos from the Japanese battleship hit the water short of the American cruiser, bursting on impact and projecting vivid greenish pyrotechnics. These were incendiary projectiles. The American cruiser in turn lashed out with all three batteries. All three turrets rather battering the Hiei all along her length. Very quickly, the call, the cry goes out through the San Francisco's remaining intercoms. We've just, we've just put a nine gun salvo into a Japanese battle wagon. And there was a great deal of cheering. From 2,200 yards, it was hard to miss. San Francisco claimed uh, at least 18 hits on the Hiei. And at this range, as I said, not even a battleship armor could protect it against the cruiser's main battery. Stationed on a five-inch mount on the starboard side, Cliff Spencer was awestruck. He said, with a pagoda-like superstructure, the big ship was so close, she looked like the New York skyline. As our stream of shells hit, you could see men, or debris, flying off the searchlight platform. It was that close. 
big large plates of metal lying out of the ship. The San Francisco, in turn, had the attention of all the Japanese heavy ships at this moment. One 14-inch 14 shell, 1,400 pounds, struck the barbette turret two, opening its seams and shattering the flood control panel. This activated the flooding system in the uh, powder handling room and the magazine, the forward magazine. The crew of the turret, believing their ship was sinking for all this water flooding down on them, began to abandon the station. And they started pouring out the top of the turret into the open to be cut down by a flying storm of shrapnel from airbursts from the Japanese sh ships. Now what these anti-personnel bursts did to people in topside stations was simply unspeakable. Naval combat, you know, the, the, the largest naval guns are a multiple of what the largest artillery ashore is. The largest artillery is what? I mean, it's typically it's 155 millimeters, maybe a little bigger, which is a, equivalent to about a six inch round, maybe. We're talking eight and 14 inch projectiles. And these are men in topside stations with, you know, with bare armor plating between them and the shrapnel. Whenever a shell struck armor, the projectile tended to br break up, denting the paint, the, the plating, and smoking up the paintwork. The airbursts hurled incendiaries and fragments in all directions. It would be estimated later that the San Francisco took some 45 shell hits, 12 of them major caliber. Thankfully, none of them were below the waterline. One armor-piercing shell bowled into wardroom country where the ship's executive officer, Mark Crowder, was convalescing after being wounded in an air attack the previous day. He insisted on remaining aboard, and this decision cost him his life. Four more shells crashed into the forward superstructure, smashing the chart house and knocking the ship's navigator, Ray Arison, clean over, clean over the uh, pilot house rail. He crashed three decks below on the barrel of a five-inch mount, uh, and the impact broke, 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 broke both of his legs. The bridge took a hit, and Bruce McCandless, stunned, ears ringing, wondered where everyone had gone. The quartermaster called out from the helm, I've lost steering control, sir, and spun the useless wheel to demonstrate. Still making 18 knots, the cruiser uh, was locked into a left turn. Steering was shifted in response to the emergency steering station after the executive officer, Joseph Hubbard, uh, was stationed. Almost immediately, a shell struck that station in the after uh, main mast, killing Hubbard and all the men around him. The first lieutenant, uh, Schoenlin, down deep in uh, Central Station, ordered the ship's steering and engine control shifted to the conning tower, an armored compartment just forward of the bridge. And that's where um, Bruce McCandless took the con. In the intervening time, the bridge was hit again and heavily. On the starboard side of the flag bridge, McCandless came to his senses and found the bodies of Admiral Callahan and three other officers on his staff. A fourth member of, the, of his staff, Emmett O'Byrne, was unconscious but alive the only survivor on Callahan's flag, flag staff. McCandless's training had never prepared him for the vertigo and shock of this butchery. Bodies helmeted and life jacketed, limbs and gear littered the deck. He told Schoenland down in Central Station that he thought he might be the only officer alive on the bridge. That made Schoenland the ship's senior officer, but down below deck, Schoenland as first lieutenant down at Central Station found himself quickly consumed with the task of controlling the flooding that was threatening to sink or capsize the ship. McCandless asked him, what are your orders? And Schoenland said, stay, so stay topside, take the con. You worry about life topside, and I'll take matters in my own hands down here. The magazines and other forward compartments were flooding, and additional water pumped aboard by the firefighting crews um, added to the problem. The San Francisco had at least 25 fires burning within her. You can now see the problem. The firefighting was rather necessary but the water from the hoses was washing down onto the second deck, which was you know, high enough to cause stability problems. And as the ship turned, the water rushed to one side or the other, causing what they call a free surface effect, threatening to capsize the ship with every turn. Um, the ship really had no uh, damage below the water line, but the water was nonetheless threatening to sink her, as well as the fires. And so um, this is where Schoenland, who was later decorated very highly for his actions, came up with a really crucial insight. He realized that he was going to have to get this water out of here, uh, but he'd have to improvise as there were no pumps on the second deck. And so what he did was he, he used mattresses and whatever else was handy to close off certain, uh, certain passageways 
and to shunt the water that would rush down. He was planning to drain the water out of the second deck into, into a lower, the ship's lower compartments. And he was able to basically improvise a system of sluice gates using mattresses and that kind of thing to uh, open up flooded compartments, drain the water out, let the water rush down the, compart the passageways, uh, kind of shunted by the mattresses to other compartments that had drains to lower decks where there were pumps. And so basically, this is why Chief Johnny is standing here today. Because we had ingenious men. Damage control was a hallmark of the US fleet all through the war. And it was this kind of improvisation that was yet another hallmark. And uh, just an incredible thing to drill into and understand how these men saved their ship. We can thank uh, a great many of them. But Sean Lind, uh, as tends to happen, the officer gets the credit. And so we're talking about him today. So after, so basically the battle, both fleets spend themselves against each other for a couple of hours. They make a pass, and eventually the large, you know, one pat, the, the fleets pass each other at close range. The base units, so-called the larger ships in each line, take their turn battering each other, and then everybody's left to reckon with what's just happened. And it takes a while for McCandless and the other surviving Americans to figure out who was in command. Eventually, they managed to rejoin with the other uh, surviving US ships, the Helena, the Juno, and several destroyers, and begin to withdraw from the battle area. The senior officer of the survivors, um, Captain Hoover of the Helena, finds himself as uh, commander of this damaged task force. On request from Commander McCandless, the Juno sent one of her medical officers and several corpsmen over to the San Francisco to assist with the wounded. And just before dawn, the San Francisco senior enlisted men reported topside to join for a gruesome ritual that I referred to earlier, um, the so-called body part sweep. Its purpose was to cleanse the ship of the remains of the of deceased crew. It's really not pleasant to talk about after a meal, so I'll skip some detail. But they wash down the ship's surfaces and make her presentable for entry into harbor. As with abandoning a ship, it wasn't something that could be done or really rehearsed ahead of time. And the decision to choose senior rates for the detail was, was aimed really at morale. This kind of duty was not lightly undertaken, and certainly not by your new, by your new seaman, second class. And so you know, the losses on the San Francisco were around 100 men. But they didn't die in vain, because as all this is going on, the pilots from Henderson Field, who have been spared bombardment, thanks to Admiral Callahan's interception of those battleships. The battleships were coming to bombard the airfield and the Marines on the island. Thanks to Admiral Callahan, the pilots were able to fly come rise of morning. And when they took off, they had quite a view of the remnants of the previous night's activities. Here's the Japanese battleship PA with a busted rudder circling and burning east of Savo Island. Here's several destroyers and cruisers. The Atlanta's on fire, dead in the water. They drop her anchor so she won't drift ashore. Uh, she's eventually uh, taken under by her fires and the flooding. Several destroyers shoot it out. Uh, the Portland has got a busted rudder as well, circling over near Tulagi. The Portland um, actually sinks a Japanese cripple with her main battery while circling. Rather a remarkable feat of uh, naval marksmanship. And several destroyers fire on one another. But it's the marine aviators from Guadalcanal who end the show. Sw swarming down the Japanese battleships and the survivors and putting them out of business. And later, in the coming days, the aviators will find the, the Japanese troop transports idling in the north. They're holding most of the 38th Division, Japanese Imperial Army, waiting to land in Guadalcanal. And thanks again to Admiral Callahan, those, those uh, transports are never cleared to come in and land. And the aviators find the transports and sink the majority of them along with the aforementioned infantry division. And so walking backward through these events, we find the campaign's moment of truth here, this frightful naval battle on Friday, November 13, 1942, that Admiral Daniel Callahan gave his life to win. The Americans absorbed terrible losses, four destroyers, the cruisers Atlanta and Juno, and about 1,000 sailors. But the effect of the loss of the Hiei on the Japanese was catastrophic to their morale. This was Ad, uh, Emperor Hirohito's favorite ship, sort of akin to the British uh, uh, emotions toward the HMS Hood, 
Uh, the Americans had similar feelings in retrospect towards the Arizona. It was one of the, just one of the emotional connections. It was one of the famous ships in the Japanese Navy. The loss of the Hiei struck their command powerfully. It would, be, it, it would be almost two years before Japanese battleships would go into action again um, off Leyte Gulf. And I think you can ascribe some of this to not only logistical problems, but the effect on morale of the loss of these ships at Guadalcanal. Now, the journey of the San Francisco didn't, didn't end after the rise of, of, of daylight on November 13th. I mentioned the sinking of the Juno. It was a spectacle that no man will ever forget to see the torpedoes pass in front of their bow, steam about 300 yards over there, hit a ship, secondary explosion in the magazine, and next thing you know, the ship is gone. The Juno disappeared in a brown pall of smoke. And for about 90 seconds, there were chunks of metal and gun turrets and gun barrels and unspeakable other things raining out of the sky onto the other American ships. There were men in the San Francisco who were wounded by the, by the uh, detritus of the Juno dropping out of the clouds. 10 survivors out of 700 men. So, you know, the, the terror of this spectacle. And now we have the return from action. This picture here is actually in San Francisco Harbor. The crew are standing and posing for uh, cameramen on um, small boats coming out with their news cameras. And um, familiar sight here. It, didn't, it, couldn't have much look, it couldn't have looked much different back in the day. But as the crew manned the rail, thousands of Bay Area residents greeted them, jamming the hillsides and promenades to have a look at this battered ship entering the harbor. The story had yet to be told, but everybody knew it was the San Francisco, and the ship's damage was evident. Eugene Tarrant remembers the cool weather that welcomed their homecoming and the fog that held the Golden Gate Bridge like a midnight pall off Savo. It was a publicist's dream, the veterans of the hero ship returning to the city where she'd been built in Vallejo, right next door to the hometown of Oakland of the Admiral who had died in battle on her bridge. The cruiser was hitched to the bollards at Pier 16, and when her ambulatory survivors were transferred to the Oak Knoll Naval Hospital and later bussed downtown for a ticker tape parade, um, a reporter said they gave the city a strange feeling of humility and sadness, and at the same time its greatest thrill in many a year. A Chron San Francisco Chronicle uh, reporter um, reported on the procession of survivors stretching out for more than a mile, attended by a crowd of 75,000. Some of the marchers proceeded with canes and crutches wearing hospital robes. However, the mood of the celebration was peculiar, the reporter said. It was said to be the quietest parade the city had ever seen. But none of the returning sailors stayed thirsty that long uh, that night on Market Street. Admiral Nimitz was on hand, as well as Admiral King, to award uh, medals for valor. They decorated Bruce McCandless with a Medal of Honor, the young officer who took the con of the San Francisco and, and, and steered her out of harm's way. The father of Daniel Callahan drove over from Oakland, but the late admiral's mother and widow stayed home. In Washington, President Roosevelt himself had just given the Medal of Honor to, uh, to family representatives of Admiral Callahan, as well as Admiral uh, Scott's relatives. Herbert Schoenland and the San Francisco's heroic firefighter, Reinhardt Kepler, received the Medal of Honor uh, as well. This is a picture of Bruce McCandless with, um, with Admiral Callahan's father, I believe. For the rest of the crew, there was a claim to go around, although many of them understood it was excessive. In the press, we were lauded beyond all reason, Clifford Spencer wrote. Most everyone knew that other ships, including the Sterrett, Monson, Barton, Juno, and Atlanta, had suffered far heavier proportions of casualties, but weren't able to return for ticker tape and free beer. The return of the San Francisco was a reminder that the glory of the glory that was won and the price that was paid by all to win the fight for Guadalcanal. The losses and sacrifices were significant, not only by the Marines, but by the Navy, who lost nearly 5,000 men over the course of the entire campaign, a ratio of, of just about three to one for the killed in action ashore. Three sailors killed in action at sea for every man who died on the island. So please remember this next time you visit Land's End and stand beside that piece of sh the ship all shot up of Japanese shrapnel. It barely captures the horror of what took place that night. Now, um, 
you know, when I'm working on a narrative, I always try to come to a visual understanding of what happened and try to understand what things m must have looked like or sounded like or felt like from the standpoint of men who are situated in compartments or on deck or ashore witnessing or participating in the events that I'm writing about. And as, you know, I'm writing about World War II, I still have the privilege and the, the ability to interview living witnesses. And I, I wonder how people write books about the Revolutionary War and the Civil War without Chief Johnny Johnson to talk to. But later in my research, I found something that really brought it home to me, because you know, talking to some of these guys when they're in their 80s or 90s, uh, there's still this barrier, barrier of years. Some of them uh, turn themselves into very fine historians through extensive reading, and that tends to get in the way of, of um, remembering the things they actually saw and heard with their own senses. So I'm constantly kind of wrestling with that. In closing, I wanted to report that today and tomorrow, um, down off Guadalcanal, there's an international remembrance of the, the campaign. The uh, guided missile destroyer USS Sampson is on hand to participate with the Australian and New Zealand and other uh, allied forces in commemorating these events. And I've been in touch with the, uh, the captain of the ship and the executive officer, and I'm very satisfied that these, these proceedings will unfold with an appropriate degree of historical understanding. So uh, thank you for this opportunity to share some of this with you. And uh, if we have any time left, I'm happy to answer questions. So thank you. <laughs> Tell everybody about the USS San Francisco. I want to make two or three points very, very added to this. The Marines landed 70 years ago on Guadalcanal. The objective was for them to keep the damn island and the airfield forever. And they did that. Our objective with the Japanese was to get them out of there. And they worked on it day and night. This battle and many other battles was about how to get rid of the, Ad the Marines on Guadalcanal. They were never successful. And I'll point out one thing more, folks. Japanese military had invaded many, many islands and many, many countries, and they never once failed until they hit the Marines of America on Guadalcanal. That was their first major <laughs> failure. Very briefly, I'm going to short this because it's a long day, and I'm going to make it short. But I want to thank Jim very, very much. You can buy a book from Barnes & Noble, where I got this one. He's going to sign it so I can give it to one of the, general, gen, the major general of Australia. So when we go to Australia, we got something to talk about. <laughs> now then, one more thing I want to leave with you, and that is this. What does it all mean, all of these battles of 1942 that was great? and wonderful. The most important thing of all was America had one year to prepare for war, and they needed that 1942. And James, you're a real hero in my book, and your book too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chief I, I will say, and this is uh, how much I appreciate Jim coming all the way here from Austin to talk to us about this. And I think being, we're, more, we're better informed about what went on out to sea. And it just was a horrific experience. And I just can't imagine what it might, must have been like that night, 13 November 1942. You mentioned that there's a ceremony on Guadalcanal on 7 August. There's also a memorial, a couple of memorials on the island. There's also a Japanese memorial on the island. And something, I, I have a friend that was just out there, and he's visited with the, some of the Solomon Scouts and the Coast Watch. And he's asked me if there are any of our Guadalcanal veterans who knew any of the Solomon Scouts or the Coast Watchers He'd like to get your name. So if you did know them, he'd like to talk with you. Please see me before you leave. And finally, he expressed the regret of the condition of the US monuments there compared to the Japanese. The Japanese are highly maintained, beautiful flowers, and the US monument is really run down. And he's asking uh, for some help. So we're going to try to figure out some way to get the, that monument back in its proper fit. I just want to let you know that. All right, big hand there for you, Jim. For, 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 for.
Thank you all for coming.